sharpening a carbon steel dado blade. For DVDs, drawings, tools, and project articles, please visit my website, AmericanFederalPeriod.com. Hello, I'm Rob Millard, and welcome to my shop. In 1999, a Lowe's opened in my neighborhood, and I used the opportunity of an introductory offer that they had to buy a table saw for the princely sum of $119. Now you can imagine what type of table saw you get for $119. It had a universal motor, so therefore it was loud and rattled a lot. The uh, fence was flimsy and barely held its setting, and wasn't parallel to the blade when it did hold its setting. The miter gauge slots were of a proprietary size, so I couldn't use any kind of aftermarket accessories. And the throat plate, well, you could throw a cap through it, and there was no provisions for making a zero clearance insert. But that's the saw that I used for 15 years, from 1999 until 2014, when I upgraded to a 1970s era craftsman table saw. It has the cast iron top with pressed steel wings, an induction motor, so it's quiet, and after a little bit of work on the miter gauge slots, I can use aftermarket accessories. But on the downside, the uh, saw is a little bit underpowered and the uh, rip fence could be better. But because of that table saw that I had, I've never really had a decent dado blade set. I had one that I bought for an earlier saw from Skill, and that wasn't a very good blade. And then uh, in 1988, I did some work for somebody and bought a radial arm saw from them. And with it came this uh, really nice late 40s, early 50s Delta, uh, well, yeah, Delta Rockwell uh, dado blade. And this is a really nice uh, saw blade, although the original owner abused it a little bit. And if this were a body, even dental records wouldn't be able to uh, identify it because the teeth are kind of burned beyond recognition. And then on my saw that I had, I used this little dial a dado thing. I think it came from Irwin but it might have came from Delta, I don't know, but I love this thing and I'm gonna cry when it can't be sharpened anymore because it's great for drawer bottoms. It doesn't work very well for wide grooves. I think it's stated width, maximum width is 9 sixteenths of an inch and at that width you get a rounded bottom. dial a are really not a very good idea. And for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, I bought this at one time and this, this has a stated capacity of 13 sixteenths of an inch of wobble dado and I actually uh, once used this on a radial arm saw. Wouldn't recommend that. And so when I've got the better table saw, I thought about getting a better uh, dado blade, but they're pretty expensive. And the eight inch ones, I just don't think my saw's got enough oomph to bring an eight inch, 13 16 thick dado blade up to speed. Now they do make six inch ones, but even they're a little bit on the heavy side because where today's chippers are, where, where the old time chippers were, well, I'll show you one here, this kind of a configuration with just two cutters, the new chippers are four. Now that does, I think, make for a smoother cut, but that's a lot more steel to spin up to speed. So I've been reluctant to buy one of those because uh, they're not cheap. They're around, oh, a good one is well over $100 and you're, you're approaching $200 for a good one. So I thought, why not take this blade here, this uh, nice heavy duty uh, quality steel one from Delta Rockwell and get it back into working order. I did this with a uh, hollow ground planer blade that I had bought when I was in high school and I sharpened it back up and used it on the uh, uh, Craftsman table saw and it produces beautifully smooth cuts almost to the point where I can't tell the sawn edge from a planed edge. And when you think about it, Almost every woodworker up until recently with the introduction of the uh, Shelix or bird heads for uh, uh, surface planers and joiners had high speed steel knives on those two tools. But almost every woodworker by contrast had carbide blades on their table saw. And really when you're working in solid wood, you don't absolutely need carbide. Sure, it's great, but it's not, it's not essential. And so I think with a little bit of work, I can really get some high quality dados out of this very modestly priced set. I see these all the time at flea markets, sometimes for less than $10. There's even some uh, good looking craftsman ones that were hollow ground. I'd like to try those because I think they would provide for a very smooth cut. I've got some of the components to the dado blade laid out here on the bench. I don't have all the chippers out. 
but uh, you can see first off that uh, discoloration that I was talking about from being abused and what I think happened was is that the blade was used by itself which is kind of a no-no with uh, dado blades they should always be used with at least the two outside cutters because you can see that this one is in nearly mint condition and so I filed the teeth on this one a little bit and on the ones that are burned and that confirmed to me that there was no loss of temper they were equally hard which is what I expected because I think these probably are high speed steel now as far as the nomenclature goes you have sets of crosscut teeth but on a normal saw you know the crosscut teeth alternate you know one beveled towards you one away from you in this case all the teeth on this extension here are beveled in the same direction and all the teeth on this one are beveled in the opposite direction and so on and so on around the perimeter of the blade and then in between you have the raker teeth and the rakers are ground or filed in this case 1 64th of an inch below the points on the cross cut now I don't know how I'm going to gauge the 64th of an inch during the sharpening process so what I'm going to do is file away the flat we'll talk more about the flat in a second and then just take an equal number of stroke on all the rakers and all the chippers to ensure uniformity because the dimension I don't think is as critical as just uniformity is and when I was talking about making a modification as it sits right now these crosscut teeth are more like rip teeth they hardly have any bevel to them the gullets could be beveled more to give some sharper points to the teeth so that's what I'm going to do and I think that will make a vast improvement over how this blade would have cut even when it was new now when I was saying about the flat a test cut revealed that there is a considerable amount of variation between the various components so that the bottom of the dado has got a lot of steps in it and we want to try to eliminate that and so to do that the teeth have to be jointed and then of course in a case of a handsaw you just run a file down the length of it till you have a flat on all the teeth and then you go from there in this case I'm going to mount this in the table saw and slowly raise it up until it contacts an oil stone and then keep doing that until I have a flat on all of the teeth that will tell me that they're all of exactly the same diameter and then I can proceed with the sharpening and for the sharpening I'm going to use two files first uh, I have this beautiful Grobet file files are getting so hard to find in high quality anymore and this is a, a single cut file 12 inches long I'm not exactly sure what cut it is I can't see it on the tang but it's on the fine side and that's what I'm going to use for the rakers and so when I'm doing that filing after I get the uh, flat gone this will make short work of a uh, filing away that supposed 1 uh, uh, difference in the diameter there and then for the crosscut teeth this is probably acceptable for this size saw this is a six inch uh, three corner file I think an eight or a ten would be better but this will certainly work and that's what I'm going to use for the crosscut teeth and of course both of these files don't have a handle on them right now but they will when I use them so now with the geometry and the modifications out of the way let's go over to the table saw and joint them this is the jointing operation and I will admit that this causes some apprehension and that's a good a healthy dose of uh, fear is not a bad thing and at no time are my fingers going to be over the blade while I'm holding this oil stone in case something would happen always off to the side like that the blade is right now a little bit below the level of the uh, table so I'm going to make sure that uh, when I raise it I raise it very slowly until I see some sparks coming off of it and then I'm going to stop when I have a flat on every component to the blade so let's go ahead and see it in operation it took a few minutes of uh, carefully raising that blade and letting it work its way down and now you'll see there is a flat on 
every blade. Some blades a lot more than others. Um, some of the chippers really have got a flat autumn and other chippers and other ends of the chippers like here the opposite side of this chipper has probably double the flat that this size had so they were not anywhere near to concentric and that was evident by the poor cut that they had but now I think after the uh, uh, filing they will leave uh, a nice crisp flat bottomed uh, dado I made this fixture to hold the uh, saw blade while it's being sharpened to cut down on the vibration and it's just simply two pieces of poplar roughly three quarters of an inch thick and about four and a half inches in diameter I turned them on the lathe and the outer one has this bevel that you need for when you're filing the teeth because you have to incline the uh, file at a pretty steep angle and I'll just put the blade in here and bolt it together and then we can go on to the sharpening process here is an extreme close-up showing the flat left by the joining process. I think you can see it on each of these teeth. And the uh, goal is going to be to file one side of each tooth um, and take away half of the flat. And you'll see this better during the filing process. But you'll have to turn the saw blades so that you can see that because uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to catch that if the lighting just isn't right. I wanted to show this process and I tried to film it, but something kept happening. I'd either get my head in the way, the hand in the way, or the file, and it just wasn't practical. So I'm going to describe the process. Unfortunately, I can't actually show it. But you saw the flats that were left, and the goal was to file all of these faces, or any face, but just pick it for consistency, and file away half of that flat while maintaining the factory geometry in as far as this angle is here is concerned and this front angle on the tooth is concerned. Now the factory uh, grind was more or less straight across like that. I inclined it at a measured 50 degrees. Now that's just the eyeball. I measured it with a uh, machinist protractor but I did not uh, take any special care to maintain that angle uh, throughout all of the teeth. I'm close but not exact and it's not that's not important and then once half that flat was gone come back to the other side of the tooth and file it to the flat is all the way gone now filing half on each side not important what is important is once the flat's gone stop filing because that's what we're after here is teeth that are all the same height and I used that three-quarter file the six inch one for this and it was not ideal. It ends up that a square cross-section file would have been much better. The geometry of the teeth is not what I expected. And this white material you see in the teeth here is chalk. The uh, file was showing a tendency to load up a little bit and by rubbing that chalk in there you eliminate that. It would seem unlikely that the chalk could keep the teeth from getting clogged but it really does work. And also the metal the, the saw blade or something it was slightly magnetic and then it would also get a wire edge so every so often I would go along with a wire brush and brush away the, the filings so I could see what was going on and uh, also get rid of that wire edge because it could be deceiving and I would have to rotate the saw blade in the vise every so often to get the light just right so I could see those flats as I was filing and then the front edge of this segment and the last edge was done with the flat file and that's just a beautiful file that one is it cuts so so nice and I, here on this front edge in particular I did not want to create a negative rake I wanted to keep the factory geometry there so I made sure that I maintained that and I think that is all the points to that so uh, sorry that I couldn't show that in real time the beveled teeth are done now I need to do the rakers and for that I'm going to use the large file and I don't need chalk in this one this one's not going to load up and I can see that flat left from the joining process and instead of just going like this I'm going to actually lock my hands in place and pivot from the waist pivot real, really kind of from the knees so my whole upper body's moving that gives me the best control and I'm going to take one light cut here to make sure I've got the same angles as what the factory was doing and I'm a little bit low in, a, in the front here so I'm going to raise that up and cut through and I can see 
the flat left by the uh, joining process it has just a little bit different sheen than the file has. So, whoa, got to get tighter in the vise here. Sorry about that. Because I'm putting quite a bit of pressure on this file. And the flat is gone now. So I'm going to take two full length controlled strokes to bring that raker down slightly below the level of the other teeth. And now I can just repeat that process on all the other rakers. I've got one of the chippers clamped in the vise and in my case I was able to clamp it straight in there but the teeth are upset to give them the proper clearance so there's a swaged area right here and if the vice jaws were such I might have to add a shim so that I was clamping on something solid and I'm going to sharpen the chipper in the exact same way that I sharpened the raker teeth and that is with the large file moving just my upper body and I'm going now see now I don't like when that skates like that that is not good for the salt or for the file so let me lower that down just a little bit I thought I had it down low enough Ugh, that's just terrible. Can't have that. That is just not good. Let me really crank down on there. Let me look at my file to see if there's any damage done to it. No, it didn't. It didn't dull, dull it. You'd see shiny places when you look at it in a raking light if it were dull. But I'm going to go more in line with the length of the uh, cutter. That might help eliminate some of that chatter. And what I'm looking for is I can see the flat that was left from the joining. So I'm trying to take that away. And I'm also trying to keep my angle parallel to that. And I can see that I'm favoring this side over here too much. So I'm going to work on that. Okay, it's still just a little bit more favored over there. Now that I've got the flat away, I'll take the uh, two strokes full length to provide the proper clearance. And now I can just repeat this on all of them. This was one of the, I guess this is a 3 16 chipper here. Uh, and then there's this 1 16 chipper so that'll be much easier to file because there's not nearly as much metal to remove. And then I'm going to mount them in the table saw and check to see if they are consistent. I, I don't even perceive that there will be a problem, but I want to make sure. Like I said, I was going to check the chippers for consistency, and I'm glad I did. And this is the setup that I came up with to check that. I would have liked to use the factory supplied dado uh, throat plate insert, but it doesn't sit flush, nor is it stable in the opening, and I need stability for this. So I installed the uh, standard one. And I've got this dial indicator magnetic base uh, here affixed to the table saw and then I've got the uh, router depth gauge that I made uh, clamped to that magnetic base indicator and I've rotated the teeth around and I placed that indicator strategically so that all three of the chippers that I can fit in this available opening here on this slot I can check them and now the dimension means nothing it's just uh, measuring them one against the other but the smallest one reads at 64 thousandths and the highest one reads at 78 thousandths. So there's a 12 thousandths variation between them and that's nearly a 64th of an inch. So I'm glad I did this because the resulting uh, bottom of the data would not have been smooth otherwise. Now I've gone around and I wrote the dimension on the um, tooth with a fine shoot, uh, with a fine tipped sharpie. And of course I have no way to gauge uh, how much I'm going to file off but I think if I go over and take one and file some off and then come back and measure that tooth I'll get a unit of measurements you know one stroke takes off X number thousands of an inch and then I can get some real consistency after that and I also have to mount the two that won't fit in there now to make sure that I'm finding the smallest one because obviously I have to go to the smallest common denominator right now that's the one that reads 64 thousandths but who knows what one of these two will read and then I can come back and uh, 
aim for a little bit better consistency than this. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be I wouldn't have a problem with five thousandths of an inch consistency, maybe even a little bit more than that. But twelve thousandths is more than I'm willing to tolerate. It took a few tries going between the vise and the filing and back over to the table saw checking it with the dial indicator to get them as consistent as I was hoping for. And now I have them that they read the smallest one at 64 thousandths and the largest one at 68 thousandths. And I think that's really pretty good. But of course the proof will be in a cut so I'm going to mount these in the table saw and make a few test cuts to see just how well it does work. But before I do that I want to talk a little bit about doing metal working at your woodworking bench. I don't really like to do that, but this was the best vice for this process, so I did it. But when I was done, I sh took the shop back and cleaned the area very thoroughly. Then I even went around with a powerful magnet to get in around the vices to make sure I got all the metal chips from there. And as a final precaution, just in the area where I was working, I lightly wire brushed the area and then uh, vacuumed it again because if you get metal chips on your woodworking surface and you get those embedded in your work they're going to cause two problems. One, they're going to dull your tools like when you're planing you're going to get little nicks in the edge and when you go to finish when you introduce any kind of water base finish and I almost always dye my wood or chemically treat it the tannin will react with the ferrous metal and make these little blue back freckles and I had that happen one time with a piece of cherry. Although I wasn't metal working, I really still can't explain how it happened. But it took a considerable effort to clean that up. So since then I've been uh, rather fastidious about cleaning up the workbench after any kind of metal working. So now I'll go ahead and mount the blade in the table saw and we'll make some test cuts and see how well this blade performs. I've set the blade up to its maximum width and I've got a piece of poplar here and I'm going to make a uh, groove and then I'm going to make a dado and see how it is. I've got it set up so it just barely cuts into the thickness because I'm more interested in how smooth the bottom is than anything else with this cut. So I'll start to saw up here and make those cuts. I've got some raking light here and I don't know if the camera can pick it up but the bottom of the groove is is extremely smooth I'm quite pleased with that but right here is something I'm not happy about and that's that uh, dado throat plate insert that I have that rocks you can see I went along at one dis depth and then when I got to a certain area it rocked and cut considerably deeper so I'm gonna have to work on that but as far as the smoothest of the cut I could not be happier and then across the grain the story is the same here I do have some scoring at the outside edges but that's to be expected because you have those uh, alternate beveled teeth that are a little bit uh, higher than the uh, rakers in there and the chippers but overall it's great now I'm going to try it with a full depth cut just to see how uh, much strain it puts on the saw but I don't expect any trouble there either Here's a full depth cut in a piece of uh, white pine and I chose that over a hardwood because white pine tends to be a little uh, fuzzy when you cut it and look at how nice that bottom of that groove turned out and how crisp and clean the sides are. So I'm quite pleased with that too. Overall I think that went very well. I have a Delta book from 1936 entitled Getting the Most Out of Your Table Saw and Joiner and in that book they recommend against trying to sharpen a dado blade. So that had me a little bit concerned, but it wasn't nearly as tedious or time consuming as I kind of expected it to be. In fact, it went very quickly uh, and the results are superb. I couldn't be happier. And on the other positive side, I saved probably a hundred to hundred fifty dollars over buying a blade. It's a blade that's better suited to my uh, table saw being somewhat underpowered. And since I work mostly in solid wood, I'm not going to miss the carbide. And as long as I don't let the blade get very dull, follow on maintenance sharpening will be a simple matter of just trying to keep a count of the strokes on the file. Won't be the necessity for all that joining and measuring of the chippers and back and forth like that. So overall, I'm quite pleased. And I hope that maybe you'll try it in your shop. And I want to thank you for watching the video.